present what's normally the last slide of a, of a typical talk first. And that's because there's a number of us involved here. I want to highlight who supported the work and who continues to support the work moving forward. And, and a number of these different granting agencies are kind of highlighted. The main one is Northeast SARE that is funding the present uh, New England Cider Apple Project. And then you see some, some Vermont orchards. There's others that are throughout the region from other states that we work with. So these are our Vermont partners. And I just want to acknowledge that and give Northeast SARE the credit they deserve for helping support this work. We've started uh, doing some research in Vermont specifically around the region in general, maybe six, seven years ago on cider apple production. And myself and myself and Liz and some others have, have presented on this in the last few few years. But if we step back to 2013, 2014, when this started to be produced on any substantial level in terms of a research focus, things were, were pretty different. So we can see the you know, Stowe Cider has this hand-painted sign in their window. This was from, from 2015 saying we can't keep up with the demand. We, there, there's not enough apples to go through this supply chain. And it's not just apples. And I, and I just talked to Mark at Stowe the other day about how I use this picture uh, as an example. Stowe Cider is producing well over 100,000 gallons of cider a year now. There's no way they need to put this board up in the window. But we still were having a conversation about how to ensure that there's a supply of fruit that can go to a cidery of their size and yet at the same time, we have other cideries that are, you know, what we might be called terroir based or micro cideries or whatnot that are operating on a completely different scale. So when I was talking to some folks from Extension around the region about this project, when we first were thinking about it, I remember one person highlighted, that's going to be tough because you're working with such a diversity of scale. And just seeing some of the names that are that are on this list on this webinar today, I know we have everything from you know pretty large, substantial you know orchards that grow wholesale fruit and then sell it to cideries like Stowe or Down East or one of the maybe larger regional cideries, as well as individual cideries that are oper- you know that are still collecting fruit by shaking them onto tarps. It's a line we've had to kind of walk and balance to find the best way to provide services and support to, to growers that really are, are talking about completely different ends of the spectrum. So it's, sometimes it's been a challenge. So some of the things that we're going to cover today sort of cover both of those ends, and we're going to invite growers from all scales and diversities of production to weigh in and to contribute to this project and other projects moving forward. So as many know, there's really two different worlds of cider apple production. The vast, vast majority of cider that is produced nationwide is produced as a byproduct of the dessert apple, you know, culinary apple market. So in order to have sufficient fruit to put in tanker trucks, we need to have a robust wholesale market that there's uh, enough of a, of a second grade of fruit to work with. And we've done a fair amount of work on that, you know, a few years ago. For this particular project, we've sort of started looking a little bit more at the specialty cider cultivars, but that doesn't mean we're only looking at, you know, these very hyper adapted or, or very specific fruit that originated in, you know, Northwestern Europe. And that's the only way to produce an apple uh, for, for cider. And again, that's sort of the, the range, you know, you've got the wholesale cold, you know, say gala fruit that people are paying $6 a bushel for, You've got the Dabinet that people are paying $24 a bushel for, completely different production systems, completely different yields, and different challenges between both of them. You can't sell $6 galas unless you're selling $30 galas. You can't sell $24, uh, well, you probably could sell $24 Dabinets, but can you grow enough of them reliably enough to be profitable doing it? So there's two really different challenges that we need to work with. And that's something that, that we try to cover. And, and again, walk that fairly fine line moving ahead. So the New England Cider Apple Project is this specific SARE funded project. It's got a number of objectives and maybe I should have ordered them a little bit differently, but this is the order they fall in, in the grant, which is what I just cut them out of. So number one is some of these cider apple cultivars, a lot of them have got a real problem with biennialism. And that's consistently been 
highlighted as a, an issue for growers or a reason why they're reluctant to grow these potentially high value, you know, $24, $26 bushels of cider fruit, as opposed to $6 bushels of cider fruit, because of this biennialism. So we have a few different projects, and you'll hear about those after number two, so I should have reordered these, a few different projects going on where we're looking at different mechanisms to try to reduce the biennialism of these of these varieties to try to have a consistent, somewhat more consistent yield from year to year. The next is evaluating some of the unique pest incidence and susceptibility of some of these cultivars, not always being the, you know, the European style bittersweets. There's some other varieties that may be suited or may be native to North America that have their own unique pest incidence or susceptibility that could allow us to tweak some of our management programs. We looked at this a few years ago at UVM on dessert varieties. We had a grower who asked me, and actually was this is a real world situation, a cidery will buy this block of fruit for a certain price. And it was higher than a typical, you know, Macintosh or Empire cider price, but certainly lower than the $24. And can we cut our sprays and our management back to meet that? And it, it kind of turned out in that situation, not really assuming that there's also a decent market there. But so that's some of our questions here we're looking at is, is what are some of the uh, areas that we can maybe change management in order to you know, re reduce our environmental footprint, but also to improve the economics of, of management. And then there's cider apple cultivar observations. And I say observations as opposed to research because I think outside of, I, I guess maybe over in Cornell probably has the best replicated real hard research you know with appropriate number of replications and, and plot design to do a good head-to-head -head evaluation of cider cultivars in new england we have a lot of small orchards we have a smattering of, of varieties on multiple orchards and statistically speaking that doesn't really lend itself to you know hard statistics but it does lend itself to good what i call citizen data and that's what the, the goal of this particular project is, is to glean the experience from growers who are on this call today and others to pull that input in. We may not be able to statistically say with a p-value of this that you know, this variety yields more than this, but we can start to glean and, and get a sense for how these fruits and these fruit being a pretty broad brush perform in New England. And so that's a piece that we're gonna that we're kind of asking for uh, some citizen science from. Certainly last year with with COVID, it made it a little bit more difficult to get out to to farms and collect this data. So you can expect to see from us uh, some outreach uh, in the coming weeks to uh, try to bring people in to collect this data from growers. And there's a community building aspect. I mean, this is one. This is a continuation of you know, the cider apple session we held at the New England Fruit and Veg Conference last year and two years before that. And we just want to continue building this community and are interested in looking at mechanisms to maybe formalize some of the, the community building that's happening. The outputs of this project are starting to, to come in. So we've got a few different places we go. Um, Liz, who's a co-host of this and, and kind of sort of the main host of this whole series, uh, runs a YouTube channel where she does some really cool anecdotal, but but uh, just standing in the orchard in front of some trees and, and explaining, you know, observations. And these are the kinds of things we want to collect from you folks too. There's the e-extension apples page. There's a cider tab that we're starting to put some of our outputs in. And there's always the Northeast SARE project report and project overview. This will be posted in the links and is a place to just keep, a, keep an eye on uh, what's happening with this project over time. All right, that's what I have as sort of an introduction. I'm now gonna pass the mic over to Liz Garofalo from UMass, uh, one of the partners on this project, who's gonna uh, talk, speak to uh, some of the pest susceptibility and some of the things they've seen in Massachusetts last year. So I'm gonna go over a couple of different things today. I will start by talking about some field observations that Dr. Jaime Pinero and I made in some cider fruit this summer. We were at two different orchards, and this one is uh, one, one of the orchards in particular. So for these three different varieties, we looked at 40 fruit per variety. Here we've got Ashmead's Colonel, Gold Rush, and Esopus Spitzenberg. 
So I lump Gold Rush into cider fruit because I think that as modern cider apple, it actually is viable as a, a an apple to be used in cider. So it's interesting though that it had 15% out of those 40 fruit damage of city blotch, seven and a half percent of fly spec, whereas the other two did not have as much. The rest of the numbers are pretty even across the board. There wasn't a big difference. Uh, Ashmead's kernel, given that it's a russeted fruit, you wouldn't really expect to see too much blemish damage to it. This is from the same orchard, but a different set of comparisons here. We've got Harrison and Wixen, which are both considered to be cider fruit, and then Autumn, which is really not. We have 140 fruit in this per variety in this sample. Autumn had a great deal more plum curculio damage to it than Wixen or Harrison did. One of the other really interesting things to kind of notice here is that Wixen had fruit cracking. Now it's hard to tell for me, as I haven't spent a lot of time observing Wixen, if that cracking is a result of the drought that we had this year or if that's specific to this particular variety. As you can see, the other varieties didn't have any cracking in it. So that will bear some future uh, observation. At our second orchard, we had 200 fruit per each of these three varieties. I was looking at Northern Spine, Golden Russet as cider fruit. And then I was looking at Macown as sort of a basis for comparison to non-cider to see if there was any difference between um, damage levels. Northern Spy seemed to be really attractive to those early season hemiptera. That's sort of like your tarnished plant bug, things like that. Um, Golden Russet was also damaged, as was McCowan, but Northern Spy seemed to have more. Um, there was no fruit cracking here either. The only, the differences weren't that big other than in that early season hemiptera. And this graph, these graphs here are the same information. I think it's an interesting way to look at the information because you can sort of see it physically better than you can just by seeing the numbers. And clearly there wasn't a lot of damage at all overall in these three particular varieties. And so the level of damage that we're looking at isn't very big. So moving on to Gold Rush and some disease issues that we see with Gold Rush, specifically Marcinina. So over the years, Marcinina has had a large number of uh, different names, things that it's been called. Uh, the taxonomists really had a field day with this one, but I will only ever be calling it Marcinina and I will be referring specifically to Marcinina on Apple. So in 2020, we had a interesting opportunity to observe the difference in susceptibility between two scab resistant varieties. We In this block, we have Gold Rush, which you see in the back of the picture, here, and then Enterprise in the front here. This is an organically managed block. And when I say organically managed, what I mean is in that both 2019 and in 2020, there were no fungicides or any other disease management spray applications made. The only spray application that was made this year was Surround, and that was on May 26th. And again, last year, no fungicides as well. So this site is largely untouched. So there's an awful lot of stuff going on. And in more normal years climatically, this is a really wet site. This year, of course, wasn't quite so wet. The other thing to note is this year, in spite of no sprays, there was no fire blight in this block. There has been fire blight in the past. So what we did is we went through the block and sampled both Enterprise and Gold Rush using this particular rating system. So zero, no visible lesions, to nine, where the tree is almost completely defoliated. We didn't really see either end of those extremes. The Enterprise was largely in this one to three range. The Gold Rush was in the five to seven range. So when I'm talking about assessing this damage, this is kind of what we're looking for here. Marcinina starts off as these dark blotches on this leaf and the way that you can really more accurately pin down the ID is that you see these black spots here. And those are the fruiting bodies. So if you've got a hand lens, which I'm sure most of you do, you go out in the field and you take a look and if you can see in that splotch, these little dark blobs, then you have a fair chance of knowing that you're dealing with Marcinina specifically. Having gone through all of that, as you could see possibly in the picture, there was a very significant difference between the incidence of Marcinina in Enterprise versus Cold Rush. Gold Rush is far more susceptible to Marcinina, which is really interesting because when we think about reducing our spray program for a cider variety, we think, well, let's throw in some scab resistant varieties, right? So we don't have to deal with that. But what happens with that is when you don't spray for scab, you end up with Marcinina in your block. 
just to sort of give you a, a side by side sense here on this left hand side of the screen, you can see Enterprise still has most of its leaves. Over here on the right, you've got Gold Rush almost completely defoliated. One of the other issues with Marcinina, of course, is that the defoliation doesn't stop with just leaves there. They also cause fruit to drop. Gold Rush is known to actually not have that much of a problem with fruit drop. However, in this block, and unfortunately you can't really see it in this picture, there was quite a bit of fruit falling off of the Gold Rush, and that was in September. Gold Rush generally isn't harvested until later. So when we're thinking about managing it, you, as with scab, you want to know when your spores are first available. In the past, I've not had the opportunity to directly observe Marcinina in its first incidence. Anecdotally, I've seen the first spore here, or the first spore there, but the problem is, is that I'm seeing them while I'm also observing ascospores, and they're showing up during that time of year when the, the ejection of spores for ascospores for scab is so huge that it obscures most anything else that you might be looking for. We did see the first one in on May 19th, but it's possible that there were some sooner than that. In terms of management, Mancozeb is still the most reliable fungicide that you can use for Marcinina. You can find uh, postings from other uh, research labs that say things to the effect of like, you can use frac group seven, like a Provia or group three Indar, but it always comes with a caveat of mix it with Mencozeb. So that's really where your early season management is gonna get you covered with Marcinina. Moving right along, let's talk about Gold Rush as cider. So I had the opportunity this year to do a quick and dirty tasting with the Gold Rush cider that I had made. Not actually quick and dirty, more like quick and masked and clean and socially distanced because that's what we're dealing with right now. So in 2019, out of the block that I had shown you with Marcinina, I got about two and a half bushels. This wasn't the total harvest, this was just what I was able to use for cider. That yielded me 10 gallons with a bricks of about 15.8. I'm really bad at doing specific gravity. I never think to do it, so I don't actually know offhand what the end ABV was. What I did is I asked 28 people who are my participants at this gathering in the fall to rate the cider using these characteristics here on the left on a scale of one to 10. One being they really like it, 10 being like, good God, what is that? So I was asking them to rate it on appearance, flavor, aroma, sweetness, tartness, and then their general overall sense of how they perceived the cider. Interesting to note, at no point did anybody go into the high end of not having any appreciation for the cider at all, so yay. We had a couple people who sort of were starting edg edging up into that category of like, ugh, not sure I'd ever drink that again. And then you can see over here, most of the votes are in that end. I'll break this down a little bit here just to make it a little easier to look at. But you notice on the top here, I've got three colors. Green is good, yellow is meh, red's like meh, no so. Those three categories in mind, We've got on the far end of the spectrum here, no, where people didn't like it, they'd spit it out, but it's COVID and you don't wanna spit in a crowd. We had three or four people in that category of the 28. We had another smaller or larger group of people who were sort of in the mid range. It was palatable, they could drink it, um, but they might not really go out and buy it again. The bulk of the people though, when you look over here in the screen column, Close to 100% of the people liked the appearance of this cider. And that was that first picture I showed you with those two bottles. Almost 75% liked the flavor. More than 75% liked the way it smelled. About 75% liked the sweetness of it, tartness of it. And overall, just a little more than half of the people thought it was a really good cider. So again, this is a small sampling and it's pretty it was a, an unofficial survey and what we've actually tweaked the survey since then and are hoping to be able to launch it when we can actually get people together and get cider into their hands to get some better information. But as a good, as a first blush, this is a pretty positive response to a single varietal of a modern apple that has only recently in the last five to eight years come become considered a cider apple. Our future plans for cider work. Uh, Dr. Jaime Pinero and I are planning on a one acre IPM cider block at the Cold Spring Orchard in Belchertown. There'll be two rootstocks and we will have six varieties. So these varieties I chose for particular reasons. 
Uh, this Nihu is French variety. It was recommended to me by a grower maker on the West Coast, and she said that this is a work horse, which she then elucidated on. Uh, no fire blight, no biennialism, easy to grow, great fruit, great crop every year. Sounds like a really good fruit to look into. The Coloradana and the Sangre de Toro are relatively new to us. These are Spanish varieties that um, were brought over, I believe, by in a collaboration with uh, Waffler and Cornell. Somerset Red Streak is a bitter sharp apple that comes from the same region as Kingston Black and is said to have the same qualities in terms of the juice that it produces without all the drama that Kingston Black can bring. So we're going to see how that turns out. And then, of course, we've got our two varieties from the States, the uh, Franklin Vermont apple, cider apple, and then Harrelson. And that is it for me. Liz, can I throw up some, some slides that I think complement that perfectly? You bet. All right. I We looked at this a few years ago, and this was part of my, my hypothesis that scab-resistant varieties could be important cider apples. Uh, mainly because you're talking about a varieties that have low inputs potentially, and you know, which means you can lower the cost of producing these and be more environmental friendly and maybe lend themselves to organic production. But also because some of the mechanisms that that uh, lend themselves to that scab resistance are high phenolics in the leaf, and and I know the leaf is not what you ferment, but high phenolics or tannins are often what you're looking for in the finished juice. So I'm going to do a quick share here. This is some data we collected a few years ago in our lab. Um, I hope you can see this with the Ashmead's kernel and brown snout. This is a listing of mostly, uh, you know, the, some of the traditional cider apples that you think of. Those being, say, brown snout or chisel jersey or dabinet uh, are those kind of classic European bittersweet apples. And we can scroll over. I mean, you can see the, how much sugar, the soluble solids and pH and the TA. But the thing we're, that I'm looking at right now, mostly of importance is this tannins column. So this is total polyphenolics, really. And this is a lot of people have sort of criticized judging a cider apple based on one number. And I fully agree with them, but it is a good way to kind of sort things out. And you can see that the European bitter, bitter sweets tend to be in these 2,000-ish you know, range, two to 3,000 range of <clears throat> milligrams per liter of gallic acid equivalent tannins. And then you can look at some of the kind of North American cider varieties that are in the 600s range. I didn't dig through because I was just doing this on the on the fly. But if you look at, say, Empire, that's down in like 200. So we're talking about an order of magnitude difference and that the super high tannin ones that you can't eat on their own, they're, they're so uh, bitter, are in that range. But if we look at some of the scab resistant variety, this was a list of, of scab resistant varieties. I don't have gold rush in here, but I have other VF resistant varieties that are in that anywhere from 400 for, for uh, Williams Pride, which is a pretty mild apple, but up in the you know, 1,000, 600, 700 range, which is in the range of uh, you know, Eziba Spitzenberg and Golden Russet. So you know, these do show with this one blunt instrument indicate that these varieties that are more adapted to our region, I mean, they were, they were bred in North America and kind of Northeast and, and North Central North America are, you know, really do show potential based on this alone. So it does make sense for people to try more of this. And then another thing to look at is some of the strictly, uh, this is some wild apples and I include Franklin cider apple in here as well, the highest tannin level I've ever measured in our lab. And this was basically a wild crab apple. So I think there's room making the jump from and these other ones, MC and NC are these wild apples we, we tested out of my, my garage cider mill that particular year. But you can see that those feral apples have got that, that tannin or that polyphenolic range up it where the uh, European bittersweets are. Not to say everybody needs to start you know, growing the apples in their hedgerow. So you can see there's a fair amount of work we're doing, which, which again, to come back around to the, the, the introduction I offered, there's a lot of sort of disparate work that you can sort of fit within cider uh, and cider apples. And I, I should say cider apples because uh, although a number of us um, have fermented one way or another, none of us is enologists, 
So we're really focusing right now, try to get as many apples, local apples into the bottles and support both those different sides of the industry. Work moving forward, there's, you know, you'll see continuations kind of assessment of the IPM or the, I, the, the pest management characteristics of cider varieties. But I especially want to push it home again. And, and this group expects, since you all provided your emails, for us to reach out in the coming weeks. Um, I have an intern this semester who's working on developing some communications platforms to, to best link growers and cideries together, as well as to help us collect some of this, uh, as I said, citizen science type data. Mm-hmm.